Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, my name is Liza Mundy. I am the director of the Work Family Program at the New America Foundation, which we are calling Breadwinning and Caregiving in recognition of the fact that men and women alike these days have breadwinning and caregiving responsibilities, and we aspire to help create a world in which men and women can fulfill these responsibilities um, somewhat more easily than many people find it to do now. Uh, we have an incredibly illustrious panel here. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is the CEO of New America and president, and um, she and I started on the same day, on we September <laughs> 1st of last year, and it's just been so thrilling to get to work with her and she is as I'm sure you all know a public intellectual and policy expert in many domains national security um, as well as work family issues and uh, beside her is Melvin White who uh, has been kind enough to um, visit us after an Easter weekend with his family in Memphis Tennessee he is the lead counsel for litigation and risk management at Clearspire which is a law firm based in Washington DC that is doing incredibly interesting and innovative things with their with their workplace that Melvin will talk about. Um, we have, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Amory Slaughter, and we have um, <laughs> Dr. Lisa Yvette Waller, who is director of the high school at the Dalton School and an expert in contemporary notions of success and how they are impacting the family. And we're incredibly grateful to her for coming here on Easter Monday. And we have Dr. Andrew Solomon, who, as I'm sure you all know, is um, author of, uh, most recently, of Far From the Tree, which is an extraordinary book about family life and parents and children who are loving each other and um, at the same time, uh, struggling with the challenges of, of difference between parents and children. Uh, he also writes, as I'm sure you know, for The New Yorker and other places and is a speaker. So um, it is an incredible honor to get to moderate this panel. And um, I'm a little bit nervous, but it'll, 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 it'll be fine. Uh, and it's a casual conversation. So people, I have questions, but people may pick up on, um, on each other's comments, and then we will have some Q&A also at the end. So I wanted to start with a question about contemporary notions of success and how they're impacting the American family. I wanted to start with a question for Lisa Waller, and just as a, a brief introduction to show that, um, that parents all over the country are incredibly concerned about the success of their children. I happen to be chatting with a woman from Houston who is an attorney in Houston, and her daughter is uh, starting college next year and was still trying to decide which college she was going to go to. One of them is a Texas university that has 12 sororities, where it is um, very common for a young woman to rush at all 12 uh, the first week of school. And it was her responsibility as the mom to get letters of recommendation from three alumni of each sorority. So that's 36 letters of recommendation and get them all on formal stationery, tie them up with a bow. So 12 bow tied packages to present to each sorority on behalf of her daughter. Um, and, and so she was doing this at the same time that she was doing her legal career and you know, hopefully some, spending some time with her daughter. And, and I wanna, this, was, this was a revelation to me and I was saying, you know, what would happen if she, if, if you didn't do it, wouldn't she still get in? And she said, well, you know, all the other parents are doing it. So all these mothers had Excel spreadsheets of, you know, desperately trying to find alumni of all these sororities. And when I was talking about sorority life, she said, well, you know, the purpose is then as you go through life, wherever you go, whatever city you go, you'll have friends there automatically. So she felt as though it was her responsibility as a working mom to get, you know, have this Excel spreadsheet and make sure that she got her daughter's letters. And I thought that was such an interesting example of how, you know, around the country, there are sort of microclimates of, you know, what success is. And, and so this, this, the idea that parents have to be extremely involved in their children's schooling, starting with preschool and, you know, sort of co-op work hours, extending, and I didn't realize this, to college and getting letters stopped. of recommendation. Right. Right. <laughs> when did this start? When did this notion start that parents had to be so involved in their children's school experience in order for children to be successful? 
And when will it stop? <laughs> and when will it stop, more importantly. You know, as I think about it, I do think that um, looking at the late 90s and into the 2000s, that's really where it starts in my world. And I, I concede at the start that my world is a particular world. The Dalton School and schools like it um, are blessed with abundance. Um, there is a sense that families actually can tie it up with a bow, literally, as in the case of this sorority. And th this is not true in every place. So I, I start with that. But I do think that um, as families perceive, whether rightly or wrongly, scarcity, uh, parents have come to believe that one way of providing some insurance to their kids is to be in there with them. And, and one thing that I often think about is when I talk to students at Dalton about my own college run, they look at me with wide-eyed disbelief. When I say to them, my parents said, go to college. It's a good thing for you. And that was pretty much it. Go to college. It's an important thing. Not which college, not how to do it. You know, got out there on my own, applied to only three schools, um, had no one really guiding me through the process. And of course, no one knew what the SATs were. They told us you should come to school, haven't gotten a good night's sleep, and be sure to bring some candies that you can nibble on while you're taking the test. Right. And that was the extent of it. Um, I think that that is unthinkable for many students today. They can't imagine that world where there isn't an adult hand guiding them. And while I understand that desire to, to shepherd one's children, and I have it myself, I do think it can militate against a sense of agency for kids, against a kind of resiliency that ultimately fortifies them for adulthood. And so, you know, when exactly did it happen? I can't say, but I do, I do chart in my own professional life a shift in the late 90s, a sense that really the stakes are so high, the opportunity is so slim, ironically, even in this world, and you really have to do everything that you can to gain an edge. I think that's about the time. I would just throw in that some version of it started well <clears throat> before that time. I can remember when the director of scheduling at my high school said to me um, in the spring of my sophomore year, he said, could you ask your mother to get her teacher requests in early this year? And I said, yes, I'd be glad to. I said, why? And he said, I thought it would be best if I had them before I wrote the teacher's schedules. Um, well. <laughs> so there was the sense that he said, if just the whole thing, I mean, I felt when I was growing up and going to school in New York as though parents were, many parents were very involved and as though the involvement of parents made an enormous difference in the success of the, of the students. Um, there was really a, I mean, there were many people who succeeded without having all of that support, but right. I think that support was a tremendous advantage. And going through the school's application process with um, my uh, son, who just turned five last week, in the first place, I thought, in connection with what you were saying about those women in the sororities, I spent an enormous amount of time on my child that I would have preferred to spend with right. my child. Right, and exactly. I felt like, which one is more important if I'm to be a good parent, the time on or the time with. But I also felt as I went through the process um, that while obviously there's sort of enormous injustice and some people are born into hard, horrifying poverty and so on, I also felt going through this process that there were parents who knew how to work the process and there were parents who did not seem to know how to work it or who did not know that it was necessary to work it and who didn't seem to grasp it. And I felt that in a world full of injustice, it seemed particularly unfair that the children of some of those parents, who I believe are just as bright and have just as much potential as my children and the children of other parents who are more adept in that process, that those children weren't going to be able to have the same opportunities. Um, and that was apart from the obvious inequalities of income and so on that people have. So mm -hmm. I see that as a, an entrenched injustice um, and a, a sort of heartbreaking one. Um, you know, and I think some parents are able to turn the time they spend on their children into um, a message of love and make the children feel very loved. And some parents who do that make the children feel unseen and very disaffected. I mean, there is a, there's another way to look at it. I mean, the, the first thing is I, I totally agree with the, just the change in philosophy. My mother always said that her, her child rearing philosophy was benign neglect. Which I actually think is great, right? It was benign, and she was always there if you needed if you needed her. But essentially, it was you know you do your thing, and I'm here, but I've got my own things to to do, and that clearly today it practically sounds like child abuse uh, in in <laughs> in in New York. But another way to look at it is, you know, the competition at these top schools has just gotten worse and worse and worse, partly because 
they are trying to be much more diverse, right? They are now reaching, first it was nationally. So the Ivy League schools used to be really East Coast, and now they are, there was geographic diversity. Then ethnic diversity and gender diversity, and now income diversity. So actually, if you are in one of those categories, you have a, a better shot. They're going to go out. They're going to look for you. They're really going to try to recruit you. If you are from a privileged background, you have now got to stand out even more, right? And, and, and the kids do, right? I mean, they, they have unbelievable opportunities. But another way to see this is that the competition really has gotten much worse, and it's gotten particularly much worse precisely for the kinds of parents who can just overwhelm, you know, do nothing, nothing else, which is a depressing system. Right. So then it becomes an arms race of parental engagement. A bit. Engagement. A yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, Melvin, was that your experience when you were in school? My, my parents were not. I mean, I, I, like I asked myself, <laughs> did my mother ever set foot in my elementary school? And I, I'm not sure that she, I mean, it was benign <laughs> black dolls. I mean, she just wasn't expected to. We didn't have, uh, we didn't have like book <clears throat> fairs and silent auctions yeah, and pajama that. day and, and teacher appreciation <laughs> week, which they had at my children's school. You know, today's the day when every child brings a flower to their, you know. And so like I live, I lived in fear of forgetting or getting the wrong pajama day, you know, like sending your kids in their pajamas on the wrong day. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, life. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Life, I, I attended school in rural Arkansas. I was and, in rural Virginia. In the 1960s and 70s. It was enough for me to make it to class yeah. and not be hungry. <laughs> right, right. And um, so I was, uh, I sort of charted my own course, so right. to speak, with the, with the help of whatever meager resources the school had, the counselor and uh, certain teachers who took an interest. And, and I guess I got here by the grace of God, I suppose, and the help of certain people. My parents did what they could, of course. Right, right. But they certainly weren't helping me with the application processes or suggesting that I go here or there, because frankly, they hadn't gone right. to college. Right. And I mean, maybe there are some regionalisms. Certainly my peers who are from New York talk about New York as a particular kind of place, even yeah. when they were growing up. And I grew up in Chicago, I grew up in the Midwest. But even in a school that one had to test into, uh, where there was the expectation that everyone would go to college and that this would be the beginning of a kind of uh, opening of doors, no one, I don't think anyone had a tutor. Um, yeah. No one talked about these standardized tests. Everyone assumed that it was going to be okay. And parents, you know, there were some moms who were on the committees that put together the benefit in this sort of thing. But um, certainly my mother was not one of them. And there wasn't the sense that there was a liability in that. You know, there wasn't the sense that you would lose something for that. And really what was focused upon in my school was, was doing well you know, doing well in terms of your academics and, you know, maybe throwing in some extracurriculars on the side. I think that now, um, you know, that, that seems quaint even, and I would, I would posit that even in Chicago, that's probably the case, even in my old school, people would think that that is just not enough, that is not sufficient. And so some of it is, is a change over time, and I think some of it is potentially regional as well. Mm -hmm. But do you think that the notion of success, I mean, to really, has also expanded in the sense that there's a much wider range of really good schools that your kids can get into and that you feel like that's great. Whereas, as I recall, there was a much greater divide, say, between the Ivy League and, and other schools or between the, the schools like Duke or UVA were much more regional. They were not sort of great national schools. Is it your sense that that our our definition, at least, of what success is in getting into college has also broadened? Or is it still everybody trying to get into this small handful of schools? You know, I think more schools are responsibly talking about the match and wanting a student to go to the school that suits them and this sort of thing. But I guess one way that I think about it anecdotally is I recall a time when a student might say something like, well, I'm more of a humanities person or I'm, I'm more of a math science person. And certainly you don't want kids to become narrow and to focus overly much when they're young. But you know, there was a sense that it's all good to, to really give it your all in terms of math science and then to be perfectly fine in terms of the other disciplines. And I think that has tended to erode. And there's the sense that kids should be at the top of their game across all domains. You should be at the top of your game in everything. In everything. Plus you should have a nice battery of co-curriculars yeah. to add in there. 
you know, some saving of the world on some level would be important <laughs> as well, um, and, and perhaps a patent to go along with that, right? Um, and so you start to feel that the kids are meant to be more accomplished than the professoriate to which yeah. they'll be exposed when they get there. Um, and one has to sort of interrogate that. And so I talk to students who I think are prepared to hear what we have to say about making choices. You know, if, if you need to do all of that, to cross the threshold of this school. Maybe it isn't the school that you want. And yeah. also interrogating the difference between the process of getting into college and, and the going. reality of being in college, of, of, of being a young scholar. These are things that I think we have to ask kids about. And so the families, and I would ask this of, of anybody, but at least I guess in particular, the families, is college what the, the, the form of success that everybody is focused on? Is that, or is there a broader definition of success in the families that you mm -hmm work with? I mean, certainly looking at our families at Dalton, I think there's a broad understanding of success. People want their kids to be happy, well-adjusted, confident, to, you know, mix it up a little bit on the playing field and also do a bit of art. You know, people want kids who are happy and trying a lot of different things, and college is one piece of that um, at the end of the, the school road, um, at least the Dalton school road. But I do think there are um, messages and pressures uh, that extend beyond the family, beyond the classroom teacher that say, uh, for, a, for a young scholar, the college run is a kind of indicator of how life will be, you know, and so I often tell the joke to my kids, you know, you start to worry that if you don't do so well on the Latin test, well, that means you're not going to get into the college of your choice, which means you won't get the optimal job, which means your life partner will not be the one you actually wanted, and the co-op board will then not accept you, and you'll have outdoor parking instead of indoor. You know, it's sort of all <laughs> built and built. And built. Um, and so not to catastrophize. Right, right, exactly. So there's a way in which um, college becomes emblematic of something that people want for their kids, and it can seed all kinds of anxiety. I think that when you really peel it back, people can think rationally about this, but it is that thing for teenagers that they think about, that their parents think about, and that they think about even before they reach the teens. I think also that it's quantifiable. So you did get in or you didn't get in. I mean, whether your mm -hmm. child is happy mm -hmm. is a very complicated measurement, and you may believe the child is happy when your child isn't happy, or you may believe otherwise. You know whether your child got into Princeton or not. That's mm -hmm. very clear, <laughs> and I think that clarity ends up um, uh, formalizing a sense of um, success. And I, without wishing to um, dwell excessively on autobiography, would say that I found the process of going through the kindergarten application process with my son had many of these same characteristics. And if that seems like a narrow definition of success for someone who's 18, it seems like a much more Gosh. narrow and indeed ludicrous definition of success <laughs> for someone who's five. Right. Um, exactly. and, uh, and the process felt to me very ex cathedra. There are oh, um, totally. a limited number of schools. There are an enormous number of people who want their children to get into those schools. Um, uh, the competition is stiff and complicated. It requires, as I say, that you um, go through these various rituals. But also, it, the pronouncements that you receive, your child's admission or not admission, appears already at that stage to say, this child is destined for success, yes. and this child only for sadness and failure. <laughs> and having gone to such a school, I can tell you that there are many idiots who get in through that process. <laughs> is your child, was, is your child and, aware of this process? That is we uh, tried to keep him as unaware of it as we exactly. could, and never to give him any sense that it was a measure of success or failure but also to keep him on his, um, at his best. I mean, I'll tell you the story. We were fortunately a school that we weren't very interested in, but it was the second one we'd gone to for the child play date. Let's begin by saying it's suggested you apply to 10 schools, as many of you doubtless know. Each of the schools requires a parent interview, a child interview, an open house, and a school, um, uh, uh, whatever, a school tour. So you have all of these 40 events that you have to get scheduled in. Anyway, we got to this particular one, we arrived with George, and there were the other children, and the teacher who was going to take them all up for a play date came down. Now, some children love getting thrown into a room with a bunch of strange children and some new toys to do things, and some children do not. <laughs> Woman came down, and she, um, she stepped outside, and she said, okay, she said, now, parents, wait down here. Kids, you're going to come up with us, and we're all going to go and play together for a few minutes. And George, who had really been quite cheerful up until that point, suddenly said, I'm not getting in that elevator. <laughs> and John and I said, George, remember it's a school visit. Best behavior. And I said, we talked to I this. hate this school. <laughs> 
showing admirable so, independence of mind. Um, you have a strong point of view. Um, right. So anyway, but it just felt as though I did. We didn't want to pressure him, but we did have to say to him, actually, this matters enough so that you really should do your best. And you know, we resorted, as I think almost everyone does, to a little bit of. If you do really well today, George, you have some ice cream afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Hagen does, I think, has done very well out of this application <laughs> process. <laughs> such a, a bifurcation of types of people in our world. So we sit here, and it's like an inline equation. You know, we know what it, 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 it takes to apply to 19 you know, elementary private schools and da-da-da. But, but is this really where America is going? Is this really broader than just this uh, a slice of life in, on the West Coast and in, in New York? I certainly I, hope. Yeah, I, I certainly hope not. I don't have enough. But but we but you you're really focused in a humorous way on something that I think is a would be like a, a foreign language to most Americans. I think it's true in a remarkable number of American cities for the elite. In other words, just having New York, Boston, um, certainly San Francisco. So I I think. It, that's still, in, it is insanely narrow, but I don't think it's just New York. I think it's worse in New York probably, but, 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 but I think it does, you do, you're putting your finger on a gap between the experience of the elite from the beginning, like getting into kindergarten versus the experience of, of the vast majority of the population. Course. That, that, that. What? When you say that, what do you mean? Then going to a regular if, school. You know, if you, if you, if you don't go to Harvard, you know, and you, if you don't go to Harvard, but you go to Amherst or you, you know, you know, what, whatever, a, 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 a decent school somewhere else, does that condemn you in a way to a different type of life? And. and I'm sorry, I, I didn't think you were talking about Amherst. I thought you were talking about people oh, fine, who were you know, dealing with. You were the one who was saying um, the humorous thing, but I think um, if you're talking about people who don't have real educational opportunity, who are going well, to schools within a broken system, I think that that does condemn them to. So let's, so let's well, separate that conversation. Uh, go to college, not go to college. You know, clearly there's a di there's a difference. We've read a lot of uh, of articles about if you, that college adds economic value, but let's just talk about all kids who go to college. Decent colleges. I'm not talking about you know mail order colleges or you know quasi bankrupt schools. That you know sort of decent uh, decent schools defined it as you will. It, is our society so broken that someone who goes to a good you know University of Iowa has has such significantly different opportunities than people who go to to um, uh, uh, the, the, the Ivies? Not remotely. You know, I think that. You have to add so much into that calculus, right? So you have the schools that people go to, but also, you know, what those students bring to those schools, et cetera. But I don't think there's any question but that there are institutions in our society um, that have been protected from broad access over history for reasons, and that um, can bring to those who enter them opportunities that otherwise would not present to them. I think that's true. Is it the difference between Harvard and Amherst? Absolutely not. Is it the difference between Harvard and you know, the University of Iowa? Probably not. But when you start talking about the sort of gross inequity and injustice in the American educational system, um, there are schools where kids are not um, 
have the conversation about definitions of success and how they impact the family aren't happening because the assumption is that those kids will not have success. And in fact, wheels are not turning to try to, to bring success to those students. Um, and so in that, once you start having that conversation, um, you know, the, these are problems of a particular subset of our society, as, as I indicated. But it's a subset that um, will not soon relinquish power, will not soon be out of power, and to the extent that we can think broadly about the implications of um, these problems on the whole, like in the aggregate, I think we, we do well. And there is a broader pattern here where uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren and her daughter, uh, Amelia Warren Chaggy, wrote this book, The Double Income Trap, where what she, she argues that what we've seen as women have gone into the workforce, they went into the workforce increasingly, and then she's looking across the middle class and lower income because that was the only way their families could keep up. So what she says is really what you've seen, and this is why so many of these families are on the brink of bankruptcy, it wasn't women wanting to work. I mean, yes, there was part of that, but it was to be able to get my kids to compete with their neighbor's kids, we have to add this extra income. That's what gives them the lessons. That's what gives them the, the, the extra bit that they need. So she actually does chronicle this, the, this notion of increasing competition to get into schools, to get into, to, to get jobs, as driving this broader dual income trap. And the trap is that if something goes wrong, there's no cushion. In the old days, if something went wrong, mom went to work. But if mom and dad are both working and you're on the edge, then, then you don't have something. So there is some suggestion that the, this, this, this hot house notion of success has a, has a broader application. Yes, there and are we, more seats in the front. For and we see it play out in, in the legal profession. Um, I believe most of our Supreme Court justices um, not only attended Ivy League schools, but I believe most of them are from New York, or large, an unusually high percentage of them are from New York City. Maybe their parents went through that process at kindergarten <laughs> that started them on the track to becoming Supreme Court justices. But um, I, I'm not a policy person, but perhaps uh, when you're looking at a profession, um, the, certainly the pedigree of school, the professional school plays a great deal of uh, emphasis on success. Do you only hire people who went to Ivy's? No, no, but there is another hierarchy uh, beyond Ivy's. There's the top 10, and then there's the top 15. And once you get beyond the top 15, it's really becomes a whole nother ball game in terms of getting positions uh, in, in the legal profession. And there I, are the kids, I'm sorry, the kids who are underserved. I mean, uh, many of the uh, so-called top schools in our cities have programs that are specifically designed to draw students in who otherwise wouldn't have that access. And those kids come in, they work hard, they do well, they compete, they go off to other schools, and they come back and talk about the fact that their lives were changed for having had that opportunity. Um, and I guess one must think about how to acknowledge one's own privilege while also giving attention to a broader world. But I, I you know, again, I, I give no credence to the notion that this is the particular school that's going to make it for you because there's much more that goes to it than that. But the, the schools that we're talking about, the schools that our schools are sending kids to, all of those schools are wonderful with professors who are committed and programs that are outstanding. But that still, with all of the kids that are in these schools, who come from very different backgrounds, many of them from no privilege at all at schools like Dalton Trinity, what have you, that still is a subset of privilege just by virtue of having access that is completely different than what many kids who are in direct proximity to our schools are experiencing on a daily basis. And I would just also say that I uh, worked for a while in a facility for juvenile felons. And one of the things that was really striking to me when I worked there was how many of the kids I was working with were incredibly bright. I had mm. sort of thought these were people who were effectively from the bottom end of the society. Many of them were very bright. And I think they had the perception, which I think was to some degree accurate, that they did not have access to a lot of what our society at large has defined as success. And so they had gotten involved in criminal activity early and especially in gangs because that was a context within which it was possible for them to achieve success. And we live in a society which is focused on success 
one way or another all over the place and people living at any stratum of it are engaged with the question of how and where they can be successful. Um, and I think there was a sense, and I think it was an accurate sense, that they could not have some of the successes mm -hmm. that would accrue to people who had gone to these universities. And there were some of them who I thought really didn't have very many native abilities, but there were a bunch of them who I thought, if they had grown up in other circumstances, could have been going to Dalton, could have been going to um, a, a fine university, could have been building a very different life for themselves. Andrew, you've also reported in, in a number of different sorts of communities, and you, uh, in Far From the Tree, have reported on families where um, the parents might have had very conventional notions of success for their child, and then it turns out that they are the parent of a child who is disabled or a child who is deaf or a child who um, you know, is significantly different from them and, and have to then reimagine their notions of success and success for their child. C can you talk about families who have successfully gone through that transition and reordering their, their thinking about success? Many of the families I talked to said that it was actually, I mean, it was traumatic, but it was also very liberating to have a child who was not going to succeed in those obvious conventional ways because of a difference or disability. I mean, it depends on what the difference right. is. There are deaf people who have gone on and um, achieved in every possible way. But some of the children with multiple severe disabilities, for example, um, those children weren't going to be able to succeed. And the parents by and large found that the process of reimagining what constituted success was amazing. I remember one father of someone with autism who said, called me one day, and he was said to me incredibly proudly, he said, my son loaded the whole dishwasher tonight. Mm -hmm. He said, and you know what? I'm as proud of that as many people are when their children get um, admitted, it was in England, their children get admitted to Oxford and Cambridge. He said, it's extraordinary that he reached the point at which he's able mm -hmm. to do that. And he talked about it very movingly and very compellingly. Now, it's not an easy transition to make, and it's not that people can readily give up all of their ideas of what constitutes success, but I think, um, I think for a lot of these families, it, um, it was actually a sort of joyful process, and it changed the way they interacted with the world. So I think about a family I've talked about any number of times, Tom and Karen Robards, who live in New York and um, are, um, uh, were sort of hard-charging Wall Street types and had a son with Down syndrome, and they uh, were unsatisfied with the educational opportunities that were available to him and so they with a few other parents um, started something um, where their kids could be educated by a teacher they found and that one little classroom for these three students has now run into something called the Cook Center where tens of thousands of people with intellectual disabilities have been educated a place where some of the changes in education for people with intellectual disabilities um, has been worked out, allowing such people now to lead lives that were really unimaginable um, 30 or 40 years ago in terms of their scope, in terms of the accomplishments that are possible. And I said to them, um, uh, I said, do you wish that your child didn't have Down syndrome? Do you wish you'd never heard of it? I said, this has been such a big part of your life. And his father said, well, for our son David, I wish he didn't have it because it's a difficult way to be in the world and I would like to give him an easier life. But I think if we lost everyone with Down syndrome, it would be a real loss to us as a society. And his mother, Karen, said, for our son, I suppose I wish he didn't have it because he might have an easier life. But speaking for myself, it's given me so much deeper and more purposeful and more engaged a life than I would ever otherwise have had. That speaking for myself, though I wouldn't have believed when he was born I could come to such a point, I wouldn't exchange these experiences for anything in the world. And I found over and over again that there were people who in, to use your word, having their um, a sense of success interrogated in this profound way actually grew from the experience. And I took away from it in part um, uh, the sense that I had always thought inclusion programs were very nice for the disabled people who were being included because they meant that they would get access to a non-separate educational system, separate educational systems being in general unequal ones. Um, but I thought it must kind of slow down the other kids and that's too bad. And at this point, I very much hope that my children will end up um, in classrooms with people with disabilities and in inclusion classrooms because I think the lessons in humanity that are taught, the questioning of what it means to be successful, um, to go back to the theme of this talk, is actually much more valuable than getting to long division two weeks earlier if they still do long division. <laughs> <laughs>
And Melvin, I just wonder, again, to Heidi's point about whether this conversation would be unrecognizable to people in many different parts of the country. I mean, I'm from far southwestern Virginia. And, you know, I think um, you're from, you're originally from Arkansas. Arkansas. Memphis. So, Missouri. I mean, do, what do you think? Do you think that this conversation would be unrecognizable to friends and family who still live where you grew up or? I would say for the overwhelmingly vast majority of people, it would be but I'm sure there is a very small elite in, in every community in this country that, uh, where this would not be a foreign conversation or an un unusual conversation. But I think for the vast majority of people, yes, overwhelmingly yes. Well, that's interesting because I, I'm just thinking again I, I, of reporting that I've done over the years. For this was a piece I was working on for the Washington Post and I was reporting on a couple, a, a teenage couple and the young woman was pregnant and I think she was 16 and he was 16 and he had been part of a gang and and she, um, she had run away from home, and they were they were really happy about the baby they were having together. They thought it was going to change their lives, and they were they had gotten the Mozart CDs. I mean, they I, I'm not I, I mean I I was interested to, to see that that you know the sense that uh, we need to give our baby all the advantages, and we need to get the Mozart CDs and play them in utero. Um, it was it was something that that, um, you know, had permeated their thinking about what they wanted to be able to give their child. And um, I mean, I, I don't know the conversations of, you know, the level of parental involvement in the public school system where I grew up, you know, that my, my mom didn't feel like she had to do pajama day and, you know, get all over involved in the school. But I, I don't know to what extent that's, that's changed where well, I I'm seeing it in the Mid-South area where I'm from, which I just came from today. I was there for the holiday weekend. People are concerned about basic survival. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a small area near Memphis, Tennessee, but there used to be a very vibrant ma manufacturing center there. And as I was driving to church with my mother, we drove down the street where my dad worked, a lot of my uncles worked, and a lot of my cousins worked who were my uh, around my age, and all of them are shut, are closed. And so, what are people doing? The question is, how are people? surviving day to day and I think that question unfortunately takes precedence for for the people in a community like that. I was thinking about that as you were I was just thinking so if I said in at the dinner table how do we define success in other words it's worth thinking about you know what what is it that you and your husband or your partner say to each other and what is it that your kids um, absorb and and I I always felt that I grew up in an academic town I had no academic family but I saw plenty of kids of academics who flamed out I mean who really the pressure to succeed academically was too great and they didn't uh, it really blighted them and I always had the view that if our kids even went to college this was a this was good in the sense that, that they were in this hyper academic environment and were likely to rebel but I would define success as the ability to fulfill your potential, right? I mean, that's that's what, as a parent, my definition of success is that my children have the ability to pursue, to fulfill whatever their potential is. But as I was listening to you, I was thinking, I don't think that's an, an uncommon definition of success, but I think it does reflect a very a, a wealthy society, right? There was a time you would define success as more than survival, but the ability to get a good job sure. and to have a family and to sim and to, and to continue, rather than this much more individual idea of fulfilling your your potential. So well, it's I'm interesting because I think of being meaningfully connected to others as a central component of success, and and that's something that I actively talk to my children about. Um, we are fortunate to have college friends who we've remained very very close to, and I'm. We are called the usual suspects, and the kids um, will say, "You know, are we going to see the usuals? Are we going to see the usuals this weekend?" <laughs> um, and what I think has come from this is an understanding that um, my success is, a, you know, partly about my education, about my work, about you know. Uh, maybe the way I parent, but it's also largely that I have this connected community that I've been able to knit them into and that they hope to keep going through the younger kids who are part of that usual configuration. Huh. And so that meaningful connectedness, I think, has certainly in the African-American tradition has meant survival. That has been central right. to survival. But it also um, 
produces a context within which intellectual discourse and you know all of this can happen outside of the sort of standard understanding of the classroom or the university and I think that definition of success is important for kids as well that they see that um, you know where they can at an early age and that yeah. that persists. I mean I've written a good bit about depression um, uh, uh, both from my own perspective and from that of many other people whom I've interviewed there are many people for whom um, success is actually keeping their illness in check. I mean, one's definition of success changes as yeah. one evolves um, over time. And I certainly think, to your point, that the sense of um, uh, uh, friendship and love, I mean, those are central components to success. I think there are a lot of dividing lines. It seems to me one of the most profound ones is between people who are doing work that they find interesting, yes. um, even if it has its tedious moments, and people who are doing work which is mind-numbingly um, tedious to them, but which they must do in order to continue to feed themselves and their families. Um, and I think to some degree, um, success can be defined in part, I mean, in part it has to do with family and so on, but in part um, with whether you actually spend most of your time, most of your days doing something that you are reasonably pleased to be doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, but how would you define how would you define success when you think about a successful life? Kids. Well, I, I don't have kids, but um, I think that for any person, um, a, a successful life involves a balance of all the different facets of being a human being, and I mean that in the broad general sense of family, of faith, of of personal achievement in a meaningful way. And 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 as you mentioned, when you get up every day, the thing that you spend most of your time on, if it makes you unhappy, no matter if you're making a million dollars or five million dollars, which we see a lot of that in the legal profession, people who are doing very well, making lots of money, but who are extremely unhappy. And are they successful? I would answer that question, maybe not. And when you go home to visit, do you think that you're regarded as, you know, a success? And, and it, do, you, do you feel that, you know, because you're in D.C., because you're an attorney, that you're leading a different life, a more successful life? Um, I believe so. I mean, uh, I'm from an area that is um, pretty poor. It's uh, the Arkansas version of the Mississippi Delta, I guess mm -hmm. is what it would be called, only on the Arkansas side. So anybody who's done anything to achieve any material success in life, it's viewed as a success. Um, um, and I don't cater to that, I don't encourage it, but I, I do uh, try to encourage people to do what they feel they need to do to make their lives successful. And I, I try to, for the younger kids, I try to be a resource mm -hmm. in terms of information about schools and colleges and what life is like in the rest of the country. Uh, so um, I do think that um, we're talking about a whole different paradigm when we're talking about that kind of an environment in our country. And I don't, uh, you know, my life has ups and downs like, like everyone's. And um, you know, I, I don't have a family. I've never started a family and uh, a lot of reasons for that. So some people who are there who might have five or six kids, but they're struggling to put food on the table, mm -hmm. they may be more successful than me in regard to, to that a aspect of life. So um, I think my own attitude is to just be grateful that I can be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, to my family and to others in the community. That is a meaningful connection to others. Sure. I mean, going to Lisa's the sure. definition. Be it as being a role model or right. answering questions it's about, a, well, what a is a lawyer? Connection. What does a lawyer do? <laughs> I mean, what do you do every day? Right. <laughs> so you don't want me to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, 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 it's all, I, I have a huge family, so um, on both sides. My dad had eight brothers and sisters. My mother had ten. And so... Nah, you know, it's, family reunion is a village. It's it's a huge it's a huge amount of people, and I'm not the only person who's done um, reasonably well in life in terms of education and career. So uh, there's a good num there are a good number of us who uh, can be helpful, and who are helpful in that regard. And in the African American tradition, as you mentioned, I mean it's it's all about um, um, nurturing and being that resource uh, for your family. And can you talk about the changes that ClearSpire has made to its workplace and the work day, and whether that speaks to um, trying to change the definition of what it is to be a successful attorney? 
Sure, sure. Um, ClearSpire is a small law firm in Washington. We have about 30 lawyers. We started three years ago. Uh, it's made up of lawyers who um, have come from other settings, who've been very accomplished in their careers, who attended um, mostly uh, top law schools and who worked at large law firms. And uh, we came together at ClearSpire uh, to try to uh, implement a new way of uh, servicing clients, practicing law. Uh, we are in a service industry. We are driven by client demands, and so that always um, is at the forefront of our thinking and our processes. But what the founders did, and those of us who've come after to try to implement this, is that we've taken the three stakeholders in the attorney industry, the client, the lawyer, and the firm, and we've tried to create a setting that allows, uh, first of all and foremost, uh, the client matters to be serviced to the highest level of, um, of, of competency. And secondly, to do that at a fair and reasonable price. But by the same token, we, we, we haven't uh, instituted a system that requires lawyers to spend uh, the vast majority of their working day billing time to client matters. Uh, we aren't uh, matter-centric, uh, client uh, hourly-centric, I should say. Um, we don't have quotas in terms of the amount of hours that lawyers should bill. Uh, we don't expect lawyers to show up every day at an office. As a matter of fact, you know, given some of the IT um, 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 innovations that we've implemented, lawyers are able to work from their home offices. Uh, unless there's a meeting or unless there's a, a court date, um, our com commute is to our home office. And mm. that in and of itself revolutionizes the workday in my, in, because so many people in Washington live in Virginia and we have pretty horrible traffic. Um, I think it's pretty do well documented. You're saving people a huge amount of time uh, just in terms of commuting. Um, and you're giving people the, the freedom to structure their day around uh, their whole life, not just billing hours to meet a quota so that partners per, per profit can be at a certain level. Um, we, um, we, um, we, the thing that makes it work really is teamwork and collaboration. Uh, we don't uh, incentivize competition among the attorneys. Uh, we work as a team so that when uh, an attorney has a need to attend to a family matter, that is accommodated. We support each other and, um, and it's working pretty well. Um, so far, it's the, the legal profession is is lawyers bring about a lot of change in our culture. Always have, all the way from the beginning of the country. But we are probably the most one of the most tradition bound <laughs> <laughs> of any of the professions. And so, uh, to change that dynamic uh, of how lawyers work is, is a major endeavor. But we're committed to it. And you've talked about a period in your life before you were with Clearspire when you were at a different law firm and you had responsibilities to your father, to mm -hmm. your elderly father, right? Caregiving, long distance caregiving responsibilities. Um, is, the, is the reason for the changes at Clearspire to enable attorneys to be successful human beings in terms of their caregiving responsibilities to others, is that, is that part of the reason for making this change or is is it something that's happening more because the profession is changing? That, that is one of the core principles upon which we're founded, that people should be able to live whole lives and to take care of their families, their children, their elderly adults, uh, others who, who may have a need. And, um, and uh, if, if the, the, the underlying concept is that if lawyers are not happy or if they're stressed, they're not doing their best work. So we, I mean, that's sort of a no-brainer. There's a, a lot of bad work <laughs> being done in this city. <laughs> well, as one who's spent time, I spent 20 years in, in the large law firm setting and working uh, the vast majority of days and nights. And so, yes, um, you, uh, when you're relaxed, and let's face it, the work is difficult. It's one of the most difficult jobs that could be done, I think, and, and especially given that it's in the service industry. So the work in itself is difficult, but when you layer on top of that this notion that you've got to bill X number of hours or you are not a success, you're a failure. No matter if, if you win yeah. major victories for your client, but if you don't reach that quota, you're not considered a success. That is a huge burden 
for lawyers in, in law firm settings. So you take that away, that in, in and of itself um, is a great relief uh, for lawyers. And so um, we, um, we're, we're, making, we're making a go of it. That's great. And so on the, on the theme of sort of changing the definition of success and pushing back against some of the escalation of, of particularly what we were talking about at the beginning, Lisa, I think at, at, I understand that at the Dalton School, you all are pushing back against the homework load that I think probably, I, I mean, I can't speak for schools all over the country, but I suspect that the escalation of homework is something that's being, that, that's taking place mm -hmm. outside of Manhattan mm -hmm. and in many school systems. Are you all successfully pushing back against that? I think so. And um, I should say that with regard to the homework load for a very long time, and even before I was in the directorship, we had articulated a policy that students should have approximately 45 minutes worth of homework per night that a class actually met. And I, I think that one of the things that we needed to have a look at is creep. You know, how creep. you're 45, right. 60, and you know, if everyone is doing that, then what happens? And, and um, I think there was a very receptive audience at Dalton because the founding of our school represented an educator pushing back against assumptions about how students best learned. Um, in 1919, when the school was founded, you know, Helen Parkhurst, the founder herself, said, um, kids learning through these rote methods where they are slaves to the timetable, this is not optimal. And because we have that legacy to draw on, I thought it was important to look back at it. And so we did um, remind everyone about the 45 minute rule and the why. Um, even further, we also wanted to interrogate the numbers of assessments, major assessments the kids might have in a week. We were controlling for the number in a day but not during the week. And in fact, kids experience school more in, in stretches of weeks rather than one day to the next. And um, you could get a kind of feast or famine thing going on. And so um, meeting with students, with department chairs, with faculty members, we all together came up with a system that we are using now that rotates um, the weeks that a given discipline might use um, for their major assessments. And I think that the product that we have is a good one, but I think the process is even more important. That this was done with students and adults working in tandem. You know, one of the first things I did was say, let's look at the 24-hour clock. There are 24 hours in a day and there are no more, no matter what we'd like to believe. So if we take out the hours that the kids are actually here in the building with us, and then we should factor in sports or clubs because we, t we say we want kids to do that. Um, having dinner could be good. Maybe talking to the folks. Might want to get a shower. Let's look <laughs> at this clock and determine the extent to which we are taking full responsibility for how we draw on that clock. And one of the ground rules was in looking at this clock, I cannot say to you as the coach, well, if only they weren't playing so much football. And you cannot say to the parent, if only you know they weren't doing so much Facebook. We have to all look at what we control. We do not control the Facebook. We do not control the family chores. We control <clears throat> the schoolwork that we ask of the kids. And looking at that responsibly was really important. Um, it was not seamless. It wasn't easy. Um, but I do think it was an important thing to do, and it's still in process. I'm always open to us revisiting this, but I think it's something that we really fundamentally had to take responsibility for. Kids need time to reflect on the work that they are doing in order to really grow from it. And so it's an important undertaking. Right. Liza, while we're talking about the clock, I think I forgot to address the question you actually asked oh. me about my father's situation, which came about while I was in the, in the big law setting and, and working um, hours uh, around the clock sometimes and on big matters. And um, uh, it was just, just a matter of my father was 85 years old and he had gone through some difficult medical situations and my mother um, was in a, it, is uh, in her 70s and was the primary caregiver but she couldn't do it alone and so I needed to be uh, there to help. And so I, uh, I, I went there to help. And I, I didn't have any obvious, uh, no one said, don't go see about your father. I mean, it's not that kind of setting. Um, people are supportive, uh, uh, were supportive on my core team. But in terms of, of, of how I did it, there was no formal process. I did it, as we would say, on the DL. <laughs> <laughs> my assistant covered for me, my uh, other colleagues covered for me. So, there was nothing, and there was always this underlying feeling of whether I was actually keeping everything going that I should have 
been keeping going and so kept going. And so um, I, I don't know if, if, if I'm responding uh, to what you asked, but um, there's no structure in these types of settings uh, for, or that typically aren't any structures, formal structures, particularly for a guy. Um, there are formal leave programs for uh, maternity and paternity, although fewer men take paternity, I think. Uh, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do other than I knew that I needed to be there mm -hmm. uh, for long stretches of time. Right. So right. We, we made it work. Uh, but it's one of the things I think that needs to be addressed in terms of um, professionals and, and who are in charge of caregiving or responsible for it. Right. I'd like to say also that I think the notion of what constitutes success is um, always in flux and the tendency is to feel that it's become a more and more oppressive definition of success and that the school applications and everything else have become worse and worse. But I would throw out the perspective that when I was growing up, being gay was seen as a failure um, mm -hmm. and as antithetical to being able to describe your life as genuinely successful. And I grew up with the feeling myself that being gay meant that I was not a success. And I think I tried very hard to be successful in many other areas in some measure because I wanted to compensate um, for this tragic deficit. And now I lead a life which was unimaginable when I was a child with a husband and children um, and sort of full acknowledgement of our relationship and so on. Um, and I think that we have allowed, not for everyone in the country, not in all geographical locations and so on, but that there has been a sea change really in the sense of what constitutes failure there. And in this particular regard, it's been actually a very constructive and positive one. In terms of the question of balance, which I think is a constant thing, I keep thinking as I listen to what everyone is saying about the wonderful moment in Mrs. Dalloway in which she's described as perceiving that her life was a thing running two blocks ahead of her that she could never quite catch up with. <laughs> uh, and I think that defines a lot of the downside of success. Well, I think, and I get what, what you said at the beginning about sort of with time versus on time, time that yes. you're with your child versus time that you're on your child. And I, I, and I think what you were talking about with your father is the with time, you know, where you're, you're there and you're enjoying your time together. And I think that is the struggle. And I, again, I'm not convinced that it's um, a, a purely elite conversation. I mean, I, I feel like in my reporting around the country, I'm thinking about time that I spent in Michigan after the recession with, with families where one or the other of the spouses had lost a job. And, and these were families, these were very, you know, working class families that felt a lot of pressure for their kids to be on the cheerleading squad and pay those cheerleading fees and the hockey team and pay those hockey fees and families that were struggling with the fact that, you know, they couldn't pay the hockey fees anymore and feeling as though their kids were going to lose out. So I guess, the, the reporting that I've done, and it's not universal, has given me a sense that, in part because of our economic anxiety that so many families feel, that there is always this escalation of what you feel like you should be providing your children. Um, and I, I mean, to, to combine the, that view with what Andrew said, I, I think, I was thinking, Andrew, as you said, I mean, to, not, I grew up in Virginia also, and certainly no one was gay, and that was out of the question. But even to be a smart woman was really not okay, right? I mean, girls who were outspoken were decidedly frowned upon. Uh, and, uh, and so there's no question, if I just look around at the number of different kinds of people and ways of being that can flourish on the individual level, there seems much, much more opportunity. But I was thinking, I mean, just going back to the point of the family, right? That a lot, a large part of you know, people were sublimated into expected family roles. So if you were a guy, you were supposed to be a father, and you were supposed mm -hmm. to be a provider, and you were supposed to be attracted to a woman, <laughs> and you know, vice versa. Uh, and so you know, and that. But also in that, and if you were a woman, you were supposed to be a wife, and you were supposed to take care of a family, and that made it possible to have family dinner, right? I mean, as you start thinking about, you know, the structure of the family, somebody was home, you could have family dinner. We didn't have an endless number of activities, so you could actually sit down for family dinner. I mean, even when I'm home, the only night we can reliably have dinner where everybody can sit down together is Sunday night. Sunday night. Right? Because every other night there are all things going on. So you could squeeze in 20 minutes of supposed family dinner, but somebody is running off to something or, or just the sheer volume of homework, right? That, that there can't be. So I was just thinking 
there are many ways in which people can flourish according to their own definition, but I do think the, it does affect that even that notion of individual striving and what it takes to get there has an impact on, on our family life and how we think about it. Absolutely. And the, no, and the notion of family is broader than it's well, that, which probably ever been yes. in our society. I mean, people may look at me and see I'm a, I, I happen also to be gay, but I'm a single gay professional. And I'm, some of my straight friends look at me and they go, oh, you must have a wonderful life. It's just you. You don't, <laughs> you don't have to do anything. <laughs> but the, in reality, um, and, and we spoke about this, Liza, in Washington, in the LGBT community, particularly in the African-American LGBT community, your friends are your become, family. become your so. family. And they are very much, and I gave the example of a friend of mine who unfortunately has been diagnosed with cancer, and, and I'm going to be there for her as though she is my sister uh, and through the every process. But there's no formal way right. to recognize There's no that. leave policy. And right. added to that is that um, LGBT people, for reasons that you touched on, Andrew, tend to overachieve, to achieve success to compensate and and hence they are viewed as having the resources mm. to provide for the extended family mm. and, and that's okay I mean and and that's fine but uh, the notion that because someone is single and, and and a professional and that their life is carefree and they don't have these notions of caregiving to, to be concerned about and success or it's, it's a fallacy it's it's very central actually even more so because if you're from a background like mine where there's not uh, a lot of economic success and then you that the bread you are a breadwinner for a huge for a number large. of people right. Right. to put it right. mildly right and so yes you're a loaf winner right. a loaf winner. <laughs> there was a perhaps discouraging study that was done some years ago that attempted to see how much of a correlation there was between wealth and happiness and it concluded that once you got above a certain yeah. income level that there was not really a strong correlation between wealth and happiness. Yeah. Obviously, people who are impoverished are struggling in all kinds of terrible ways. What did have a bearing on happiness was how wealthy you were in relation to the other people right. in your social group. Right. So if you were moderately more successful than all the people you spent time with, you tended to have quite a high happiness rating. Oh, no. And if you were a millionaire who moved in a circle of billionaires, you tended to have quite a low <laughs> happiness rating. Yeah, not very that's attractive, but that's, that's what they found. That's funny. That's funny. You know, well, thinking about the family, um, one uh, contrast that I'm able to think on often is um, when my oldest child was born, um, I took off a year from work because I realized that I could simply give my paycheck to the person who I would hire to look after her. I could look after her myself. And so I decided that I had the cushion to do this for a year. And then my, my mother and my father came to New York from Chicago, um, complete longtime Chicago people who had done the great migration up from the Deep South. They came to New York to live with us. Um, and the other component of this is that my brother, who actually has autism, had just aged out of the public school system in Chicago at the age of 21. I could not find resources in Chicago that I thought were suitable, but I could find in New York. And so all things came together. So my parents and my brother came to New York. Um, we all moved into a house together. My husband, my, my older daughter, and then ultimately my younger child was born. And I will say, those were the golden years yeah. wow. uh, because, you know, I, we all get on very well together and my parents have a lot of autonomy. They do their thing, we do our thing, and then we do our things together. But those were the golden years. I remember calling my mom and saying, um, you know, I'm at Dalton and I'm going to be late. And she said, Lisa, why do you call me? I am with my grandchild. Do not call me. Just come home when you're coming home. <laughs> you know, like, and, and, you know, I process that and, and just the weight that fell off of my shoulders yeah. because I was like, they're all taken care of. And it got to the point, you know, my dad would drive us to school. You know, my mom was making the lunch. My husband was looking after this for my mother. And the whole organism worked together so well. And again, I, I recognize that there is a blessing in my family being able to get on with each other. Uh, but this is something that um, I had hoped to construct even before I had kids. And that it all came together was amazing. And being able to compare now that they've gone back to Chicago, the difference is quite profound. I think the compensatory component is that my older child is now old enough to do more things mm -hmm. on her own. Mm -hmm. But my parents are looking to come back with my brother because they will be aging. Yeah. And my mm -hmm. brother is only 30-some years old. 
you know? So someone has to look after him. I want to be sure that he's with me, that my kids know him for who he is, their uncle, and not like that weird guy from Chicago. The fact that they grew up with him has made a profound difference in terms of how they respond to him and his ways. And so um, I have met a number of people who've talked about the extent to which extended family, whether uh, by blood or fictive extended family, can really help to negotiate these questions of how the family dynamic operates within the context of increasing demands on the individual Tell me members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got lots of questions. We have there. time for <laughs> maybe one or two oh, no. questions, or if, ask if you speak really quickly. So right, um, right there in the middle, you're slowly lowering your hand. Yes. Hi. It's been a very interesting conversation. My name is Susan Oxhorn, and hello again. And um, you've talked a lot about the definition of success um, in terms of the adults. But one of the things that I'm interested in, because I'm interested in child development and early, child to early care and education, is the effect of the anxiety and these expectations of success on our children. Um, and I think that it's, it can be quite toxic. So I'm wondering if you might talk about it. Um, I also wanted to say that um, I have my children, I grew up in, I raised my children in New York. They went to public school until high school. I have friends who have children at Dalton, um, which is a wonderful school. But the children in public schools are being subject to a race to the top where how much homework they have is, is really uh, irrelevant. There are children in kindergarten who are bubbling in on standardized tests. So there's a lot going on um, universally. Uh, and also here we have universal pre-kindergarten that's, that's being implemented. So I'd be interested to know. So the, the question would be the impact of everything uh, we've uh, talked about right, on children. Right, yes, on children it, that, it, who are internalizing yep, this. Yep. Well, certainly from my vantage, I'll say again that I think that um, students who are overly rushed, overly programmed, um, lose the opportunity to reflect and to really process um, what they're learning. I think also um, high school students who are driven <coughs> to acquire courses, experiences, scores, um, just at the moment that they're sort of developing adult identity, um, can lose a valuable access to their authenticity, to who they want to be and to what they value. And this is <laughs> to say that students can do whatever they want. But um, I do think there's a way in which these success paradigms tend to have a cookie cutter component so that, you know, success for you is meant to look the same as success for me when that is, of course, not the case. Um, and so, I go back to that word interrogation because I use it quite often with the students. Ask yourself why you want to go to that school. Ask yourself why you want to take this particular course. Ask yourself why you need to be a three season athlete instead of two. And there could be good reasons for being a three instead of a two, but you need to ask. It needs to be deliberate. And to the extent that we can help kids to ask these questions, and to sit with the answers and to try to access their own authenticity, I think we can militate against some of the anxiety um, that um, can be around that. Right. How do you mean? They don't have the choice to interrogate? You mean in terms of, I have a, I have a child in public school as well. Are being, um, that are being created are mitigating against that very, very important process. And obviously, These children aren't playing. They don't have recess. They are spending time, you know, in testing. So, and then they have on top of this 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 notion of what success should be that they are, they need to be on the track to right. that. Right. Know, I mean, I have a child in public school. school, and I have a child in private school, and I guess I would so say know. that, um, as is always the case, we must function. Um, within our context. And we can certainly push against that context, but you also, um, in one way, have to dare to dream. So, you know, if, if the issue is whether it's a Regents test or the Common Core or the APs or the SAT2s, um, 
I, I guess, again, part of what it has meant to grow up um, on the margins is you can learn to do those things while not buying what they signify, while not accepting what they signify within reason. I mean, because I can't wave my wand and completely change the school system as it currently stands, I think then to try to be as subversive as you can in terms of undoing what those, those batteries signify for those kids is one beginning at least. It's not a solution, but it's a beginning. So if I, we can, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. Is that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in writing uh, my book, I have a chapter of the last book, a chapter about prodigies and about families of prodigies. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting research to do. In the first place, I think many families um, confuse developing quickly with developing far. And those are two different things. And being way ahead of your um, age group does not necessarily mean that you'll be great at what you're doing when you get to be older. There were many of the children, of course, fell into the sort of hackneyed thing of having so much exposure so early on and developing such a sense that their validity was contingent on their ability to perform in this specific way, um, that they actually had a very low self-image even though they garnered a great deal of applause. But there were also interesting conversations that I had about the question really of how we define success and much of how we define success in this perhaps elitist way, but I think um, fairly uh, generally is in this sense of broad accomplishment. And there was one young man who I interviewed, um, I interviewed him and I interviewed his mother and I interviewed them together. Um, he was, at the time that I met him, he was eight. He looked like he was six. He was taking um, uh, piano lessons and practicing for up to eight hours a day. He wow. was flying once a month um, from uh, San Francisco where he lived to Shanghai because he wanted to get Chinese technique as well as um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Western yeah. technique. I mean, there was a whole sort of scenario. And I was sitting in the house and I said um, to his mother, I said, do you worry at all about Mark having a normal childhood? And Mark said, I already have a normal childhood. Do you want to come upstairs and see my room? It's really messy, but you can come anyway. We went upstairs and he showed me his favorite cartoons. And I noticed a big stack of Sesame Street videos sitting next to the... TV, and then he said, um, okay, now let's go downstairs and I'll play you the Chopin Fantasy Impromptu. And we went downstairs, <laughs> and he sat down at the piano and played that piece with an adult yearning and nuance that seemed inconceivable in someone who still liked Cookie Monster. And when he finished, his mother turned to me and said, you see, he's not a normal child. Why should he have a normal childhood? It wouldn't have been my position, but I thought it was an interesting one. And she said, why should he expend energy on learning all kinds of other things that don't interest him when he has this extraordinary talent that gives him so much joy? Mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting dialectic to, mm -hmm. uh, to contemplate. As long as it gives him joy. Indeed. <laughs> that would be my test. Yes. <laughs> you you know, question? we were supposed to do a hard stop at 745, so I think I'm this probably going to have to end People it. have to have yeah. dinner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so thank you. I, I hope that whatever question you had, I hope that we at least somehow broached it during the course of this incredibly interesting and to me moving conversation. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you all so much.